Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, um, my name is Breck Max, and I am the business and finance advisor here at the Native American Development Center. Uh, with us today, uh, we have Mr. Jake McSheffrey with the the DBE program, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and he's going to give us the lowdown on on the program. And um, for all of you uh, Native contractors or minority contractors out there, this is. Uh, this is the program we'd love you to uh, take a look at um, and uh, listen to Jake about all the things, uh, all of the good things that uh, come with be, being certified as a DBE. So, you know, with that, Jake, go ahead, uh, introduce yourself and um, and we can just do a deep dive. Give us give us what you got. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Breck. Uh, so my name is Jake McSheffrey. I'm the business projects manager at a company called Project Solutions. We are contracted by the states of North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska to help manage their Disadvantaged Business Enterprise or DBE program. So today we're going to go over a little bit about what the DBE program is, talk about kind of what my role and my company's role is, and how it can benefit potentially your company and ways to get enrolled and, and get involved in the program itself. So today we're going to be going over some objectives talking a little bit about the eligibility and application process for the program itself, the advantages of the program, so why even bother do it in the first place. We'll look at some strategies for the DBE firms and for prime contractors as well, because it's important to understand both perspectives to really yield the most out of the program. We'll look at some resources that are available to you. And then specifically with North Dakota, we'll talk about business development opportunities that are also available for firms that are certified. So to begin, what is a DBE? So you're going to hear that all the time, DBE, DBE. It stands for Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. And what's important to note is that there's a lot of different small business certifications. So there's MBE, Minority Business Enterprise. There's women-owned and operated business enterprises. There's 8A, there's DBE. There's all these different acronyms. Um, so it's important not to get them too confused. Specifically with the DBE, it's different from the other ones where it's a state administered program. So even though it's a federally mandated program, it's administered by the state. So sometimes when you're searching for it or you're going to certain development centers and you throw the term DBE out there, depending if you're talking about the federal level or the state level, it can get a little confusing. So remembering that DBE is a state administered program. And so to become a DBE, what, what the actual definition is, is a small for-profit business concern that is at least 51% owned and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. And we're going to go a little bit more into what controlled, owned and controlled actually means in a few slides here. So a few general facts about the program. Like I said, it's a federal program. Um, USDOT is managed by Federal Highway, all of these big federal organizations, but it's actually given to the state DOT specifically to manage them. Um, depending on funding and resources and how states want to manage their DBE program, sometimes they will contract a third party. So that is what North Dakota has done. They've contracted Project Solutions to help manage the program, which is a great thing because, you know, state resources are pretty limited in terms of money and people. So whenever you have the opportunity to help have another source come in and help manage it, you get a lot more detail oriented assistance. Um, we can really devote a lot of time to helping firms get certified, helping them learn about the program, help develop their business. Um, and it really opens up a lot more opportunities that perhaps just a state organization couldn't offer. So the DBE program, it does apply to all DOT operating administrations, highway, aviation, transportation, um, and it helps disadvantaged business owners compete for transportation related contracts. So when you think DBE, since it's run by the Department of Transportation, all of the projects are going to involve some sort of transportation element. Um, mostly highway construction, surface or horizontal surface transportation construction. Um, so if this is if you work in a field or an industry that could be related to that, this is a program that you could benefit from because it's going to open up some more opportunities in that government procurement arena. So in DB construction trades now, I just said it's all about highway construction. One thing that you may be surprised or if you're in the industry, you're not surprised. There is a ton of different trades that are actually involved in building a bridge, building a highway, repairing infrastructure around a, you know, a city sidewalk, anything like that. Um, there's so much that goes into it, more than just paving and striping. This is just a few of the a non, not all inclusive list of the different companies that we have. Um, 
you know, I would even add here something to note is janitorial services. So we have firms that are certified that come out and they bring all the porta potties out there and they manage all that, drive them off site. They're DBE certified and they get sought out by these prime contractors to help augment the project. Um, electricians, you know, somebody puts in, pays all the road, but somebody else has to come in and put all the all the wiring for the the lights and um, the signage and whatnot. So there's a lot of different trades that can bleed into this, and I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't encourage you to just write off the program because you don't think, oh, well, we don't build roads. We That's not really something I do. Really take a look at what you can do. And if the skill sets and equipment and personnel that you have can be applied towards this type of construction industry, it's it's a great thing to look into. It's I should say getting certified is completely free. So it always will benefit for you to, the only thing it costs you is some time, which we'll go into. Um, but you don't wanna discredit yourself or not give yourself this opportunity because you don't think you don't fit into the program. Um, there's a lot of opportunities out there and, and people get pretty creative. We even have, um, I know it says architecture on here. Um, we have an archaeological consulting firm, several of them actually that are DBE certified because that's another element that can get brought into. So I talk about this because I really want to encourage people don't just write off the program because you don't think you fit into highway construction because you just might. It's worth talking to me or talking to somebody about to see what skill sets can be transferred into that. So the program objectives, and these are at the federal level, um, but the overall objective and, and direction of the program is to ensure non-discrimination in the award of admi and administration of federal aid contracts. So these are contracts that are funded by the federal government, and when they get um, you know, subcontracts to a prime or past that when a prime subcontracts to you, this program helps ensure there's no discrimination in the award of those contracts. To create a level playing field on which DBEs can compete fairly for federal aid contracts. So again, there's a lot of census studies that the government has done, and they continue to determine that based on past discrimination, current discrimination, and things that have happened over time, there are still outlying effects that are present today that have affected the, you know, people of a disadvantaged status. So that's why this program exists in the first place. It's it's a way to rectify past infractions and that have had long-term results on how we operate today. So this creates a level playing field. It doesn't necessarily give you an advantage. It just puts you in a position where you're going to be getting the same advantages as non-disadvantaged um, companies. So to ensure that the department's DBE program is narrow, narrowly tailored, this objective is important because they don't want to just certify anybody and everyone. Um, there have historically been cases of fraud where somebody may put their company in their wife's name and now 51 percent is in their wife's name so now they're they can be classified as a dbe so it's important for state dots to really you know narrow down are is this is this firm actually owned and operating controlled by a disadvantaged individual because the intent of the program is to create that level playing field not to be exploited to ensure only firms meeting eligibility standards can participate as dbs so that goes along with what i was just saying to make sure that all the requirements are met to help remove barriers to DBE participation in federal aid contracts, which is basically we'll talk a little bit about how the DBE program works because it's goal based versus set aside based. And I'll explain what that means a little bit down the line. Um, but this is basically talking about removing barriers to counting DBE participation. And the last objective is to assist in the development of firms so that they can successfully compete outside the program. This is where North Dakota has a really fantastic DBE program because we actually do offer business development assistance. And once you're DBE certified, all of that consulting and, and business development is completely free to your firm. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the details of that consulting, but this is the, the point is to get you enrolled in the program, get you more opportunities to get experience and get involved in these projects, help develop your business with the intent that you can graduate out of the program and be an independent, successfully owned company. So it sounds great. You get DB certified, opens up new opportunities, but what, what's required? What are the eligibility guidelines? So ownership must be 51% owned by a socially and economically disadvantaged individual or individuals. So if you and another individual own 50% each, 50-50, then both of those owners in order to qualify for this program would have to be able to successfully claim economic and socially disadvantaged status. If it's just one person who owns 51%, then they're the only person that's claiming the status and they can still, um, if they meet the eligibility guidelines, can still enroll in the program. So business size determination. So a firm, including affiliates, must be a small business 
as defined by SBA standards. So Small Business Administration, they define these standards of what is considered a small business. And the, the dollar amounts change depending on your industry and your mix codes. Um, but the average annual gross receipts has to be under 30.4 million in the previous five fiscal years. Basically what that means is that if your firm is gross revenue is over 30.4 million on average, you're not you're no longer considered at the economically disadvantaged status and you don't meet the, the eligibility requirements of the program. And then as an extension of that personal net worth, the applying individual has to have a net worth that's less than 1.32. If it's over that, they're also not considered um, economically disadvantaged. So these are pretty large thresholds. Um, having a, a personal net worth of 1.3 million or bringing in $30 million a year on average for your business is, is a pretty, pretty significant numbers. And they do that because they want to have a lot of space for a firm to get enrolled in the program and have time to grow. They don't want you to just get a little bit successful and then get booted. They want to give you time to grow, learn more about the industry, become more well-rounded as a firm um, and as a business owner so that you can take that out into the industry, help other people and, and overall just enrich the industry. Because that's that's the point of the program. The point is to you know create that level playing field, but we're also trying to bring in new perspectives um, you know, creative problem solving, you know, take all these different people from different backgrounds, different outlooks and different ways of life, bring them together to 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 enrich the industry as a whole. So having these higher numbers helps give people more time involved in the program. And so the next two control is socially disadvantaged. So control is important. The disadvantaged owner seeking certification must possess the power to direct or cause the direction of the management and policies of the firm. The owner must also have an overall understanding of and managerial technical competence and experience directly related to the type of business in which the firm is engaged. So that's very wordy, but essentially what that's saying is that if you're the individual who the 51%, the person claiming um, social and economic disadvantage to get enrolled in the program, you have to be the one who's running the company. So you have to have enough understanding of what the company does. So say it's a paving company, you have to have enough technical experience at to, to, to make directions and guidance and decisions about the way of the company from that standpoint, but also from the management side. So understanding how to own and operate a business, how to do certain functions. Um, it's worth noting here, you don't have to be an expert at any of this stuff. You don't have to be the best business owner or the, the best tradesman that's ever existed. You just have to have a general idea and be able to show that you are in charge, that Yes, yes, I may have somebody else who is my technical expert. They're the ones that go out there and do all the work. They know they're the engineers. They know all of the, the terminology. I don't. That's OK. But as long as you're still directing what that individual does and you're making decisions about, hey, we want to go after this job. We're not going to go after this job. We're going to hire this person. We're going to rent this equipment. Um, we're going to purchase this accounting software. As long as you can prove that you are the person in control of the company, that's a huge indicator. You know, I talked past just before about the fraud of just putting the company in someone else's name to claim the status. This is where that would come into play because there's a point during the application process where you get interviewed. Um, and it's, it comes across clear as day if someone has no idea what they're talking about or if somebody's just new to something or um, it's pretty clear to tell. And we'll talk about that interview process down the line as well. But the control is a big aspect. And we know that there's a lot of, you know, scenarios where there's the husband wife kind of a thing. Um, we've, you know, from the past, you know, myself being in economic development too, I've seen it, it you've got a lot of contractors that are, they're just native, uh, are their husband and wife teams. And of course, um, how did, in your experience, how, you know, could you explain a little bit more about that? Just that kind of scenario there, you know, cause I know that, you know, there, I do have a client, a woman owned, uh, and boy, oh boy, she wears the pants in that business and she knows what where everything goes, where every penny, every dime is, and, and every project, she knows it top to bottom. So, but, you know, just from your own experience, um, could you elaborate a little bit on that? I mean, in terms of control for these sure. husband and wife outfits? Sure, absolutely. So it is pretty common. There's a ton of firms that I work with too, that are owned and operated by husband and wife, companies in the wife's name. Um, I would say more often, it's usually in, in this particular industry, it would be the husband is usually doing the whatever the trade work is and the, the the wife is usually back doing all the office management, HR hiring, mm -hmm. doing all the bookkeeping and stuff. Um, it does switch sometimes. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing here is, and, and there's no direct, here's how it will be. 
Every firm is unique. That's why there's an interview to really get to know the firm. Um, as long as you understand the intent, the intent of the program is to give disadvantaged individuals a level playing field. So if it feels like you're kind of working the system or that you don't really fall into that, but if you do it this way, now you fall into that. If it feels a little dicey, then you're probably not meeting the intent of the program. And whether or not that's going to come out in an interview, I don't know. It, it kind of just depends. But I can tell you in the past, um, we've done interviews with the with husband and wife firms and you know they're asking questions to the wife who's claiming the status and you can tell the husband is right there whispering her all the answers right off camera just whispering the, the answers to her and so that's a huge red flag so if, and when they're asking things like you know do you have a marketing plan and then someone's just like yes we do <laughs> yeah. okay can you describe it you know so it, things like that that's and that's has happened it, it's happened multiple times. Um, so I would say ultimately with the control piece, it can be tandem control. I mean, if you're talking the the wife owns 51% and the husband owns 49, husband still owns 49% of the company. They expectedly would be heavily involved with a lot of the decisions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It just, right. as it, it needs to come across that the person who's claiming the 51 is not just the face of the organization, that they actually do have control. Um, the other piece, the the CFR, which is the federal guidance on the program, goes into a lot more detail, and it specifically goes into examples that your company can't be structured in a way that the non-majority shareholders of the company can vote you out, um, which has happened before where somebody says, oh, sorry, I'm no longer the head of the company now anymore, and I was uh, outvoted by my peers. Okay, well, then no, you can no longer qualify for the, the disadvantaged business enterprise status. So, um, it's pretty simple. As long as you're the person that's actually in charge of the direction of the company, you will be able to prove control. And then the uh, socially disadvantaged. So you may be eligible if you're a member of a group of persons that the department considers as disadvantaged. Individuals who are not members of one of the above groups, the above groups being a list of um, firms that the, the federal government has identified as if you are qualified to one of these groups, you can automatically be considered socially disadvantaged. Um, and if you don't fall into one of those groups, you may also um, be eligible if you can prove and establish that your, your individualism has been socially or economically hindered based on other people who have a similar situation that have not been hindered by their social or economic status. Um, so just because you may not fall into one of the, the different categories doesn't mean you can't be enrolled in the program. It just means you might have to show your disadvantaged status in a different way. Again, that's what we're here to help with. So when you're kind of trying to figure out if you're eligible, I'm the person you can call to, to kind of talk about your business, talk about your situation, and I can point you in the right direction that, yeah, you should definitely still apply for this. Um, or maybe maybe you don't fit for this program. Here's some other options for you. So once you go through that kind of first initial crash course of am I eligible, what's what the program is, um, We'll talk a little bit about the application process. So North Dakota uses this certification and compliance system. It's an online system. It's really, really great. It's really easy to use, especially for the vendor or the applicant firm. Um, you'll go to this link, which we can provide. It's actually just dotnd.diversitycompliance.com. Um, but you'll go to this link. You will begin your certification application, which is on the left-hand side here, DBE, ACDBE certification. And then you put in your basic information and then you'll start attaching documentation. Um, so anybody who's been involved in any type of government procurement in the past or has applied for other small businesses will already be aware of this. But the biggest warning I give people is that there is a lot of paperwork. Anytime you're involved doing work with the government, there's a lot of paperwork involved. And that's the biggest deterrent for people is, you know, they start, they see all the documents they have to gather. They start getting frustrated. It's they get overwhelmed and then they just throw the towel in. Um, and that's again, that's what I'm here. If you get into this process and you start getting overwhelmed or you start saying, I don't know, this doesn't apply to my firm. How do but they're saying I need to have this document. I don't understand. That's when you just call me, email me. Um, the system is revolved around so many different types of companies, trucking firms, suppliers, manufacturers, contractors. So there are going to be some questions and requirements that don't apply to your company. You know, if you're if you're not a trucking firm and the, the website's asking you to supply your, your DOT truck number, you're gonna say that that's, doesn't apply to me. Um, again, so we're here to help kind of navigate through that process. 
like I said, the documentation is a lot. Um, all, applic all applicable documentation must accompany the application. Materials are kept confidential, so that system is locked down. So as you upload confidential documentation, such as taxes, personal net worth statements, things like that, um, all of that is confidential, it's secured. It's only gonna be reviewed by DOT personnel and personnel who are qualified to actually look at the applications. Failure to submit the documentation delays and terminates the process. So, like I said, this is the biggest part. The I get the call all the time asking how long does it take to get certified? Um, and the process is actually fairly quick. The longest part is gathering all the documentation, having a little bit of back and forth potentially about, hey, you didn't attach this or you need to correct this. Um, but once that application is fully completed and has all the proper supplemental documents attached to it, it's a pretty quick turnaround. And we'll go into that process as well, too. But this is, like I said, this is the most overwhelming part is putting together the documents, getting your business taxes, your personal taxes, your personal net worth statement, list of employees, salary, remuneration schedules and timelines. There's a, there's a lot of documents, um, but don't use don't don't let that deter you because we're here to help walk you through it. So when you, you finally get all these documents, you apply and people get denied. Why do people get denied? What are the biggest things to worry about? So lack of experience. Now this one is a little bit of, there's a little bit of a caveat to here. So having lack of experience in your firm, it doesn't necessarily mean you're new to something or you're you're wanting to try to get involved in something you have the equipment. Um, that's okay if you don't have all the experience in the world. Like I said, you don't have to be a master at accounting to start a business. Um, you just have to have a general, either hire somebody or learn to do it to be able to be profitable. But lack of experience really goes into that you don't have the equipment, you don't have the people, you don't really have any of the know-how. You know, you say, hey, I want to drive trucks. I want to be a trucking firm. OK, well, I've never driven a vehicle in my life. I also don't have any money to buy trucks. I also don't live in, the, you know, this country 60 percent of the day or 60 percent of the year. Okay. You don't really have the experience or the equipment or the personnel or you're not ready to operate. What they're looking for are firms that the day they get certified, they're able to start bidding on government projects the next day if they so choose. Lack oh, of but I'm going to use about. a bunch of subcontractors. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Right. And, right. and that's, that's the thing. That's their, They want a big pool of subcontractors. So when these primes are saying, hey, we want to find these DBE firms, that they're looking for people who are ready to go um, so they can con contact you and really get right to it. Mm -hmm. Lack of control. Talked about that a little already. I think enough. Um, if you don't, if you can't prove that you have control of the company, you're not going to get that the the status. Lack of documentation talked about as well. Make sure everything's there. Emerging rather than operational. This kind of bleeds into lack of experience. Where if your company's just emerging, you have a good idea, um, but you're not operational yet. You're not ready to roll out and start doing work. You could get denied. Um, that's not all encompassing. I've seen firms um, who are new, who are just kind of getting getting rolling still get certified because they're at a certain point where they have they're going to be ready to go very shortly um so again don't disqualify yourself still you know call ask about it and we can figure out if you're ready to to take on this program and then negative control negative control specifically talks about that situation where somebody else your other share owners could vote you out so you have control but you don't you can't maintain control or you can't guarantee that you can maintain control that's what negative control is um so some other examples of if there's a quorum without the presence of the disadvantaged owner, um, if the non-disadvantaged owners can prevent the attainment of a quorum um, or any way preclude the disadvantaged owner from making any and all decisions. So if there's any ever a situation in your company where a decision can be made without you, that's negative control. So why get certified? What are the advantages for, for certified DBEs? So first of all, let me kind of explain a little bit how the DB program works. Um, I said before that there were these other programs had set asides where there's actually work that is given to these certain certifications. Say, hey, in order to do this job, you have to have the certification that's here for you. Um, whereas the DBE program is goal based. So the DOTs will assign a goal to a project. Um, they assign them annual goals, project goals at all different levels, but they will basically say, OK, hey, maybe we're going to sign this. We're building this stretch of highway. We want a 5% DBE goal, which means 5% of the dollars that are being used on that project need to go to DBEs. So when prime contractors are going to the government and they want to put in a, a proposal and get the job to build this highway, 
they have to show the government, hey, we can meet that DBE goal. So they turn around and they solicit DBE certified firms and they say, hey, do you want to bid on this project? We need truckers, we need pavers, we need electricians, we need signers, we need we need MOB, DMOB, all this stuff. They start get they start subcontracting all that work out to DBE firms. Then they can turn around to the state and say, hey, look, I my DBE goal is at 7%. I got all of these firms to participate in this project and that makes them more competitive. So that's how the program works. It's kind of a mutually benefiting program. Um, honestly, with all three parties, the, the subcontractor DBE firm benefits because they're getting more exposure to work and they're getting solicited. The prime contractor benefits because they're actually getting the job and getting the work because they're using DBEs. The state benefits because the state's meeting their DBE goals to the federal government. And the industry overall is benefiting because you're getting all these different experiences and perspectives and um, different backgrounds coming into the industry, which which enriches the industry, like I said. So that's how it works. The primes are going to solicit DBE firms because they want them involved on their projects so that their bids can also be more competitive. So the, certi the certified advantages, certified DBE advantages are that A, DBE participation goals on federal aid transportation projects. Since there are going to be goals on projects, there's going to be opportunities that DBEs have to be solicited. Expansion of business opportunities. So this is going to open up more doors, more opportunities for you to try different things. Um, diversify your portfolio. So perhaps you're doing work in a more rural area. Perhaps you're doing work in a more urban area that can kind of just expand the different exposures that your company has and the different things that you can put on your capability statements and market towards other companies to help grow your, your company. Bigger projects generate more cash flow. So you can be subcontracted to a fairly large project, a long stretch of road or whatever else the project may be and you know bring in more cash flow, which in turn helps you grow your business, get more equipment, get more people. Gain experience and mentorship. So this is a really, really, really massive advantage of the program that's kind of not really highlighted as much as, yes, the experience, you're gonna get working on different projects, different people, so you're gonna grow an experience, but that mentorship piece. So you, you're gonna to wanna to use every event, every contract you have, every time you get a job to talk to the primes, to talk to you know different people, network, get to know them, get to know what's working for them, what, what DBE firms they like to work with and why what firms they don't like to work with and why. Um, you get to learn a lot. You get really kind of a, a foot into the door of to, to pick the brains of these people who have been in the industry for 30, 40 years and really learn kind of what, what works and what doesn't work and what's the future. What are the trends that are coming down the line that your firm can kind of prepare for and, and incorporate now so that you're more competitive? So that mentorship piece is huge. And getting involved in these projects with different, all sorts of different primes and hearing from all different people's backgrounds and stories can really help you. Interstate opportunities, so you can get DB certified in all the different states. Um, like I said, it's it's mandated in every state. So if you're you know located right on the edge of a state line and you're willing to work in the other state, you can get certified there just just as easily. Um, and once you're certified in your home state, getting an interstate certification is very very simple because 99% of your application is just your home state application. So it's not like you got to do it all over again. You just have to submit that and then maybe one or two additional documents. And it's it's a pretty quick process. Nice. Yeah, it's it's great. And you know, it's for some people, if you're smack dab right in the center of the the, the state, and you know, you don't really have the it's it's not going to be profitable to transfer across state lines. It may not be beneficial, but as you grow, that may be you know maybe another option. There may be projects, or you may perform a certain work function that's missing in another state or another municipality or district that you can satisfy. So a lot of market research and figure out where can we be most profitable. Yep. And the program benefits on top of everything I went through, we're going to talk about the business development down the line, which is a, a great program benefit. So it's important to know the other side too, because just because you're a DBE firm doesn't mean you can't be a prime contractor. Um, we actually do have some DBE firms that are primes and they subcontract to other DBEs, which is really cool. So for the prime contractor, they get to subcontract uh, for required specialty licensure. So there's some things that primes just can't do or legally they're not allowed to do because they don't have licensure. You know, electricians comes to mind. If, if you're a general contractor, but you don't have any staffed electricians, you're going to need to subcontract that out to somebody who's licensed. Still missing labor components. A lot of times people will hire erosion control companies or any type of landscape companies to help with the, the embankments on the side of the highways. That may be a component that a general contractor just doesn't have or or specialty you know if they're if it's a demolition and they're taking down an old fuel site and then there's a fuel leak underground and that needs to be cleaned up 
according to EPA standards, a general contractor may be like, I, we don't know what we're doing here. So they will contract to another company, which again, we also have DBE firms that are involved in fuel cleanup, something you wouldn't really necessarily associate with building a highway, but um, it has happened where they get called in um, and they have to do some extra work. So it's more cost effective by utilizing a subcontractor's efficiency. So whenever you try to do something that you don't know how to do, you don't have the equipment to do or the skill set, it always takes more time and costs more money. Um, that's why it's easy to subcontract. You know, a lot of times people will say, if we can do it in-house, we can do it for cheaper. But that goes with having the equipment. You have to have, especially if it's specialized equipment, you have to have all that. So if you don't, you have to rent it, which is very expensive. Um, if you don't have people who can do it, you have to hire, you have to either pay for training, which costs time or money, or you have to hire subcontractors to manage the equipment anyways. Um, or it's just the whole process is going to get done wrong because you don't have experts doing it. So for primes, they want a subcontract and they want a subcontract for the bottom reason, more competitive for government awards. So if they're going to have to subcontract this work anyways. It benefits them to subcontract it to a DBE firm. So strategies for DBEs. Now, this is this is also really important. I like to cover it too. I know it's a little early to talk about strategies if you're not even certified yet, but I think it helps kind of put the 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 whole point of the program and, and a way to approach it into to perspective. Um, one of the biggest complaints that we hear from prime contractors is that they struggle with getting their subcontractors to turn in their submittals on time, their paperwork, um, all the things that they're required to turn into the state. Like I said, government contracting is a lot of paperwork. Um, and then communication is another big one. So there's many times where contractors will reach out and communicate with DBEs and they just don't communicate back. Um, and that's that's really hindering. So it can be frustrating for a prime contractor when you're trying to solicit all of these DBEs and nobody gets back to you or nobody's communicating with you or they aren't fulfilling their, their component correctly. So to stand out from your competition, because like I said, there's not set aside, it's gold based. You still need to be competitive. You still need to market your firm and, and be a successful company. Here are some things you can do. So know your numbers. Um, this really bleeds down to job costing. When you're doing project based work where you're going out to a site and you have to you have to do a proposal and job cost for time, labor, materials, um, inclement weather, anything that could happen to delay the project. That all comes down to job costing, which is probably one of the most important and least understood elements of project based work. It's incredibly important to know what are overhead costs, what are direct costs. If you rent a piece of if you purchase a piece of equipment, should the cost of that be applied to a, pro a project? Should a contractor be paying for the rent of the office space? You know, how do you allocate costs? And then if you know your numbers, you know all these costs, that's how you determine a very accurate bid. And here's exactly what we will propose, and this is what we will charge to perform this labor component. And that's what makes you more competitive. A lot of times when people say, I don't understand how anybody else is doing these numbers. I don't understand how they're doing the work for that cheap, or um, I don't understand why I'm not getting selected for any work. It usually boils down to job costing and how you're allocating those costs and, and what you're charging. So doing that, performing that function, that's incredibly important. Market yourself and make yourself accessible. Like I said, you still have to market your firm. You still have to do your market research, find out where you're going to fit in best, and then let people know who you are and that you exist. DBE program is nice because you will have a lot of work come to you because you'll be added to that directory. So they'll just be mass emailing and mass calling and sending out all the information to your firm. But you still have to go out of the way and, and seek out opportunities too. Communicate effectively. The biggest thing I'll say here is that prime contractors have to satisfy what's called good faith efforts which means in order for them to bid on this job that has a DBE goal, if they can't make goal, they have to prove to the state that they did everything they possibly could. They met the good faith efforts. Um, and a lot of that goes into, one of the things that goes into that is they have to contact firms three times. So if you get email from a prime contractor after you're certified saying, hey, do you want to bid on this job? And you don't respond, that contractor has to contact you two more times just to show the state, hey, I tried. So. When you just email right back and say, no, we're not interested or thanks for keep us in mind for the next one, that makes your firm stand apart because not a lot of firms do that. And then that gives the prime contractor, OK, this firm may not be involved in the project, but at least they communicate with us. They tell us we don't have to email them back and forth. So when they do finally say yes, you're going to be a firm that's remembered in their head that, oh, these people are communicative. They respond and now they're saying yes. So let's let's take a look at this one. And that goes into building and maintaining relationships. Relationships are so important. Um, prime and sub relationships are a particularly unique relationship, and it's important to understand what makes those tick and how to be most effective in that. 
complete all project documentation in a timely, accurate manner. The thing I like to say here is um, in the contracting world, people don't get paid until all the pro all the paperwork is done. So, you know, to see the frustration, you your DBA, DBE firm may complete the paperwork, submit it to the prime. It's all correct, but another subcontractor hasn't. And since that other subcontractor hasn't done it correctly, the prime's not getting paid, which means your company's not getting paid potentially. So it's really frustrating when certain companies, whether it's the prime or the subs, aren't doing their paperwork on time or they're not completing it properly because it really hinders a lot of different people. Um, so being able to do your paperwork on time, get it done correctly with the right format, everything that the primes or the general contractors need is hugely important and it makes your company stand out big time. And then the last strategy is to fully understand the scope of work and the specific requirements. So this goes into before you even bid on a job, Make sure you, you know the specs, make sure you know the scope of work, what is actually being required. You can work with the primes to look at the project, um, look at all the specifications, all the diagrams, charts. Part of their good faith efforts is that they have to actually talk, talk you through the project. Here's exactly what we need. Here's what we're looking for. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what the estimated timeline, time start, end date is going to be. Um, so you really want to know that because you don't want to get into a point where you bid on a project, get it, and then down the line realizing that, it involves more than you're capable or willing to do. And now you're bleeding money just trying to get the job done or you you need to subcontract it because you can't perform the function. Um, and so I think a big thing here is just once been communicating, going back to communicating with the primes and making sure that you understand the scope of work and job specs before you actually bid. So the next one strategies for primes. Again, this is you could be bidding as a prime, uh, even as a DB or just knowing what they have to do. Um, so no cuff limitations. So cuff stands for commercially useful function. To get the DBE goal credit. So like I said, they want to hit 5%. Say your DBE, the work you're doing is going to fulfill 2% of that. Uh, whether maybe you're a supplier and you're selling the company a ton of stuff. So that's going to be 2% of the dollars. Whatever it may be, to get that 2% goal, the DBE has to perform a cuff, a commercially useful function. Um, the primes are allowed to help DBEs do their job. They are, but only to a certain extent. So, for example, say if you were a trucking company, the prime can't give you their trucks to do the trucking because now you're not really serving the commercially useful function. You're not really a trucking company. You're just a truck driver and you're driving a different company's trucks. Um, or say you're a supplier. You're the, you're the person selling whatever it may be to a, a construction company. You have as a supplier, DBE supplier, you have to actually have an inventory, a warehouse, an office, a shop, something with an inventory on shelves that you sell to the public. You can't just be a broker is what they call where a prime contractor says, hey, DBE supplier, I want all this rebar. And then you call rebar XYZ company and say, hey, bring all of this rebar to this job site and that company brings it. Now you're just a middleman, so you're not performing a commercially useful function. You're just getting DBE credit for not really doing much. So primes need to know how much they can help out DBE firms and how much the DBEs have to do with themselves in order to get that goal. Special provisions. These are every state has special provisions, so different responsibilities and criteria that goes along with that state DOT. So it's important for primes and subs to know what the special provisions are in that state. Provide feedback. It's important for primes to, to talk to their subcontractors, let them know what they're doing good, what they're not doing good. Um, it's also important for the, the subs to seek that feedback, but it's prime should be open and available and willing to provide it as well. Program involvement. So when primes get more involved in the program, it's important because the DBE firms, they want to hear from the primes. Those are the people that are hiring. Those are the people that are paying them. So, you know, I one of the things I do is a lot of training and try to bridge that communication between subs and primes and say, hey, here's what the subs are saying. And hey, here's what the primes are saying. Now work together. Um, but when the primes get involved and they host trainings and they you know, have that face to face with subs, that's really beneficial for for the program as a whole. So we try to encourage the primes to get involved. Um, you know, it doesn't do them any good to be in a room full of subcontractors, say nothing. And then as soon as they leave the room, come to me and say, here's all the problems I have. That doesn't do any good. You know, they, we want them to to you know, from the horse's mouth, so to say. And then utilize NDDOT and project solutions. So this is primes and subs. Utilize your resources. Go to the state. If there's if the primes are having a problem, they can go to the state. If the subs are having a problem, they can go to the state. And they can also come to us. We, Our function of project solutions is more to help alleviate problems and um, provide training and development. 
any real authority, any real actionable item that needs to happen, the state is still the authority figure. So they're the ones that are going to have to actually handle disputes. Um, we kind of can just help smooth things over, provide strategies for overcoming problems, not so much say, OK, legally this person's not doing their job. That would happen at the state level. So the DBE Supportive Services Program, Project Solutions, this is what we what we do. We are the DBE Supportive Services Provider. So um, our how we get paid is all funded through Federal Highway Administration. So whether or not we get people to use our services and help do the training um, or whatever, it doesn't really matter, which is great because we're not soliciting firms to get enrolled with our training as a way for us to make money. We're doing it as a way to truly expand the potential and, and cast a, a big wide net and get more people enrolled. We don't get paid by the firms, we get paid by the government. So we also provide customized training and guidance, meeting firms where they're at. We do initial business reviews, annual business reviews, one-on-one um, -on -one training to really figure out where you are as a company and as an individual or individuals. What are you looking for at your company? What are you hoping to do? What, what are you good at? What are you struggling at? Where is your company really excelling? Where do you, you know, trump other companies? And where do you kind of fall short of what other companies are capable of? And, you know, we do that by helping firms grow their business financial profile and their management potential. So just looking at your business, what you, what you have, what you're capable of, and figure out how to capitalize on that. So these are some of the things that we provide. Application assistance we covered. We're here to walk you through the entire application process. Understanding DB programming guidelines. So going through those special provisions for each state, um, going through what, what you have to do to be eligible or to maintain that certification. Confidential one-on-one -on -one business services and training upon request. So we're here available all the time. So if you ever want certain training on maybe HR strategies or um, you know, say you use QuickBooks and you don't know how to, to pull a certain chart of chart of accounts or you don't know if your QuickBooks is even set up right. You know, any whatever one on one session you're interested in, we have a team of consultants that we can swap in, swap out to help cater to your specific interests. Coaching and training on how to bid, put together estimates or read project plans. So like I said, you can also use um, go to the primes for project plans. Sometimes they're a better resource, but we also provide training on how to actually the whole government bidding process, you know, how to put together an estimate. And, and, and how to get from point A to point B. In-person and online training seminars ranging from basic to advanced business topics. Again, anything that your firm is currently tackling. We, we, we work with firms at different stages of their business. Some are just starting off and they're one person in a truck and they say, hey, I don't even know how to, you know, I don't even know what a balance sheet is. And then we work with some firms that are 8A certified. They have their DB certification in five different states. They've been in business for 15 years. Um, and now they're looking at maybe selling their business. So they're saying, hey, what do we do to sell? So the whole range from cradle to grave where, where we help assist with that process. Assist with capability statement development. So we, we will help craft and edit and expand a capability statement, which in the government procurement world is massive. Capability statements are super important because it's basically a one shot, one snapshot resume of what your company can do. It's just, it's almost like your company's business card. You give it to somebody, it's got all your equipment, it's got everything you can do. It, it really helps contractors, primes, government entities, just really get a full understanding of what your company is capable of and how you operate in one page. So not everybody has them. We highly recommend having them. Um, if you ever go to procurement, government procurement events, networking events, a lot of times they'll say, can I see your capability statement? Just because that's that's kind of the going rate for how this world works. So we help develop those, or if you already have one, help increase it. You're so or, on, Jake. That is a big one. That is a really big, and that's awesome that you guys have that uh, capability to uh, provide support. Uh, during my PTAC days, that was uh, another one that I really focused in on with my with my contractors too. So, but yes, you're dead on. That's a that's a biggie. That first impression you make, you know. And you only have a few minutes. Um, yes, that that uh, capability statement is important, critical. Yeah, absolutely. And and some people they'll they'll show us their capability statements or website, and we're like, hey, that looks great. We we wouldn't recommend making any changes. Um, mm -hmm. So again, it really is catered uniquely to your company and, and where you're at. We also do a monthly newsletter. So we actually do a newsletter for North Dakota and South Dakota. So if you're interstate certified, you'll get them both. Um, and the newsletters are great because they'll have bidding opportunities. Um, they usually have one to two articles that are related to either the DBE program or ma business management in general. They're not very long. They're not research papers. Um, they're kind of quick tidbits. You can read, get a little good information and move on. 
Um, they also have upcoming training events, partnerships. Um, did you know? Just you know, they're they're probably between five to ten pages, and most of that are bidding opportunities that take up a lot of space. So they're they're a nice, definitely another good resource to have when looking for opportunities or trying to keep up to date with the industry, the program as a whole. And then networking events with prime contractors. You know, I talked about in the last slide getting prime contractors involved. This is one of the reasons why. So we try to do networking events, matchmaking, get people subs and primes in the same, whether it's virtually or, or in person, the same universe here and talking to each other and asking those questions and having those candid conversations about um, contract work, government bidding in general and, and the construction world itself. So when I was talking about business development, these are some of the things business management consulting, job costing, financial review, marketing strategies, business plan development, which is another big one. So the capability statement's huge, but if your company doesn't have a business plan, that's also critical. Every mm -hmm. company should have one. Yeah. Um, yeah. They all look, they all follow a general similar format or they should consist of certain items. Um, but this is huge, especially when you're trying to secure funding. When you're trying to get a loan, any capital or go to a bank, they're going to want to see a business plan and, and get the warm fuzzies that you have it figured out. Um, you have a goal, you have a direction, you have your financials laid out there, um, even projections. That's what's going to give a bank the the comfort of saying, OK, this person is responsible. We'll we'll lend them the money. So that's a really big one, especially if your company needs bonding requirements and things like that. Um, but having a business plan is important, and, and we also assist with that development. Accounting software setup. Um, we do a lot with QuickBooks, but we can look at other softwares as well. And then bidding and estimating assistance. So, I mean, that's the whole nature of this of this world is that you're bidding, you're putting together an estimate, you're submitting it to someone and hoping that you have the best proposal and get selected for the job. So that's all you're always competing against everybody to have the lowest cost, but still have, you know, profitable margins and be able to to get the work for as much as you can while being competitive. So that's that's the it's an art, it's a game. It's sometimes you just get beat, sometimes you take a hit, um, you know, for the experience. Maybe you don't make as much as you want, but you really want to work with this contractor or work this job and get this experience. So there's, there's an art to it, and, and we help businesses make decisions in that regard. So this kind of just further breaks it down the things that we talk about, financial management, leadership. Um, a lot of the stuff too that I'd like to highlight is we do a lot of the hard skills. So the the, the technical stuff, the bidding, um, marketing, contract compliance, um, but a lot of the soft skills we can go over too. And I think in today's world, even more so, the soft skills are incredibly important, maybe even more so, or as much as the technical sk hard skills. And when I say that, I mean more, you know, the emotional intelligence, the leadership, the being able to, to provide your staff, your employees, your team with what they need to keep them. You know, you may have heard of the war on talent that's happening for the past maybe five years and not going to end anytime soon where recruiting and retention is incredibly difficult. So what can you offer as a company, as a as a leader to people that's going to make them want to work for you and stick with you? Because retaining qualified personnel is one of the most significant challenges that any company is facing right now. And a lot of that bleeds down to what are you offering or, you know, the, the shift in what people want out of a job has changed, you know, dynamically and see it used to just be I want money well now studies are showing that throwing money at the problem rarely ever solves and you know you could throw more and more money and watch people walk right out the door and because they're looking for other things they're looking for you know work-life balance and they're looking to have more control over their 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 working schedule which can be difficult in the construction industry but there are strategies and unique things that your company can do that even if you can't offer a super highly competitive salary, if you can offer some of these other benefits um, and get creative with it, more people are taking jobs based on that and based on feeling that they're in an environment that they want to be, even if it's not necessarily at the salary that they want to be at. So those soft skills training and looking at those strategies is incredibly important. So why participate You know, in our program? And I talked about it a little bit, uh, but certified DBEs must advertise aggressively. So yes, you're going to be getting the emails, but you still need to go out there and do it. Like I said before, um, you need to be able to market yourself. You need to create opportunities um, or get ahead of the game. If you know a project's coming down the lines or you know they're going to be working on a certain section of road or park or something like that, um, there are resources you can go to to figure out who are the contact people for that and get ahead of it before. Don't wait for primes to contact you. Contact them and say, hey, this project's coming down. I'm very interested in working on this. Just wanted to know if your company is going to be bidding on it. 
you know, you're already setting yourself up from the apart from the competition in that regard, especially with the communication factor, which is huge. Um, bid competitively. If you're if you're throwing out random numbers or you're just trying to make the most money that you can, you may not be very successful in winning bids. So it's important to understand how to bid and what you should be cost or charging. Performing that commercially useful function. So it has happened in the past and it's not a good it's not a good thing at all. Um, but it has happened in the past where firms don't perform a commercially useful function. And then as a result, they end up not getting the DBE credit for the project. So the prime contractor doesn't get the credit. The state doesn't get the credit. Um, and people will still get paid. The DBE will still get paid, but probably will not be solicited again or chosen because of that factor. So you don't want to get into a position where you don't know what you're doing or you're doing something incorrect. And now you're hurting the DBE goal because you, you as a certified DBE isn't performing correctly. So again, it's important to understand that, and that's with the special provisions specifically in the states because it's different for each state. That's why it's it's helpful to come talk to us about what exactly is expected of you or what you can and can't do in order to get that goal performance satisfaction. And then strive, so meet performance expectations. So I always say you don't have to be a Fortune 500 company, but you have to act like one. A lot of these you know, big prime companies have started off right where, you know, all the small businesses started off. Everyone starts from somewhere. Um, and, you know, to be a successful company, people put their, put everything they got into it. Um, and that's what a prime wants to see from your small firm. They want to see that you're putting everything that, that this project, that this company, that this work is so important to you that you're putting everything into it. And that's how you really stand out. You, you get people to, to to understand that hey this person is is here they're showing up when they said they were going to show up they're getting their work done they're asking questions they're getting involved they're interested they're passionate those are that's who people want to work with and you'll find that if you can develop that relationship and you can stand apart and be consistent and provide you know have really good work you're meeting your your cuff function um and, and you're being and you're being communicative you'll find that primes will still choose your bid even if it's not the the cheapest um, one of the trainings we do when we're talking about prime and subcontracts talks about the different types of bids. And one of them is lowest bid, which is selecting whatever dollar amount is the least. If this this firm said they would do it for the cheapest, they win. Um, and that's not always the case anymore. Now it's it, it really bleeds into this firm said they'll do it the least, but this firm is the second least and we've worked with them. And I know they get their stuff done. This other firm, I'm not sure. Let's go with them. It's a safer bet. You know, trying to manage risk and and allocate risk on a construction project is a, is a big part of being a prime. And when they when they know they can trust somebody and they can give, you know, offset a little bit of the risk, say, you know, the supply chain industry is crazy right now, but this supplier is always reliable. So let's let's go with them. They're a little bit more money, but we know we're going to get our stuff on time. That can play that plays a huge factor. And that's how you can actually adjust your your job costing when you build that reputation. So meeting those performance expectations is is, is big. So kind of just to wrap up here, the DB program aids to provide access for a variety of construction specialties to complete on federally funded transportation projects. And that's that's essentially the core of it. It's it's giving disadvantaged companies the ability to, to bid competitively on these federal projects. Firms must meet eligibility guidelines and application requirements. We went through them. For more information, if, if your firm is actually interested, you can contact me and we can go through every single criteria. We can go through every document if need be. I mean, I even do Microsoft Teams share screen with people who have their computer open and we're walking through each line of the application. So um, don't ever hesitate to reach out with questions about that, because like I said, it can deter some people from the, at the very beginning. And all you got to do is get over that initial hump and then you're certified. It's there's an annual renewal after that, which is just one piece of paper you have to upload and then move on. It's very simple. Um, getting interstate certified is simple, so it's just working to get over that very first hump. Um, and that's what I'm here to help with. Firms must dedicate themselves to their performance and business development. So take advantage of the free training that we offer, you know, on whatever you want to get some development in any area of your business you think you're not performing as high functioning. Or if you don't know and you want to do a business review, we can help identify weak areas that maybe we should be, you know, devoting more time or people, you know, looking at your finances. Is it worth it if you if you're the bookkeeper and you're terrible at it? How much time are you devoting to just trying to figure out bookkeeping where you're taking away from something else, you know? The thing we try to convey to people, and it's tif it's difficult with the small business, but um, you know, first and foremost, you're a CEO. You're running a company. That's your main job. So you may also be the person out there 
doing all the, the the work itself too. That happens a lot with small businesses, but you need to be able to carve out time and opportunity for you to manage your company and grow your company. Otherwise, you're just going to be chasing the next project, next project, and you're not going to grow or you're going to get a lot of work, take it all on. And since, but you're not going to have the foundational strength to manage that as a company. So payroll will start getting missed. Um, promises won't be getting met. It, that growth, too, growth that happens too quickly can be incredibly damaging to a company and we see it all the time. So we really try to help people figure out where they're at and help grow their company while growing their workload as well. Bringing confidential services provided the certified DBs. So just exactly what I'm saying. We're we're here to look at whatever you're willing. If you don't feel comfortable show, sharing with us all of your financials, that's completely fine. We don't have to do that. Um, if you do, completely fine. We can actually you know go in, share screen with your QuickBooks and say, hey, you're allocating costs to as a direct overhead cost, that's not a direct overhead cost. You're gonna to wanna to put that here, which is gonna change what you should bid. Um, so it really is up to whatever the firms wanna do. Um, and at the end of the day, here's my contact information. So up at the top there, that's my phone number, that's my email, call me, email me at any time. Below that, Amy Conklin, she is the program administrator. So she's actually up at the DOT. She's my direct con uh, contact with the North Dakota DOT. Um, she's fantastic. She's also a resource to reach out to, but um, like I said, I'm I'm here to kind of answer all the, the walkthrough questions, get you certified, and then help with the business development. She's more there to oversee the program as a whole, and if disputes or things come up, she is the authority figure to do that. Um, she's also one of the people who will be in the interview with you when you're when you're getting your certification, asking the very simple questions. And that's that's pretty much the summary. So the program is fantastic. It's a great way to to get these firms um, to open up new opportunities. Don't count yourself out of the program. You know, feel free to give me a call. Look into it yourself. You can go to the website. You can just type DBE or North Dakota DBE and you'll get as much information as you could possibly want on it. So if you need help interpreting, come to me. Um, and yeah, that's ultimately we, we we just try to get the word out there and we try to get people aware of the program, get them involved and and help grow them where they can. So. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to this or to watch this. Um, and like I said, do not ever hesitate to, to reach out. We also do it for South Dakota and Nebraska as well. So if you have any other firms or know people in those states as well, they can also reach out to us and, and we can help get them certified. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jake. Say we do have a we have a late comer here, Sean. Um, I'm going to open up the mic. Uh, have you got any specific questions? Uh, I know you just popped in on us here. Um, any specific questions for Jake? And um, he's got his contact information up there as well. So if you need to visit with him, you're more than welcome to do that. Any questions at all, Sean? He may or may not have a mic. Let's see here. That was me. <laughs> it was me. Oh, think, there we go. Yeah, I think that was me. I am. Um, we've just had. We have a small. Um. Um. Uh company that we put together in South Dakota and we've just it's a Native American firm and we're yes we're just trying to get it get it you know and we just got it put through SAMS through the government website so we're just you know trying to and it's good information to you know try to get you know get more DBEs and get stuff like that going so yeah we're yeah, we're good for now excellent okay great thanks for joining us um you know, um, also, um, Jake, um, we we don't I don't have a large portfolio of native contractors, but, you know, definitely when I get them, I'll definitely make sure they know about you guys and about this wonderful program, about the DEBE program and um, and get them referred over to you as quickly as possible. I'm I'm amazed. I didn't know the, the cash of services that you've got at your disposal there. It's uh, how big is your team? Um, beside yourself um, in the background, you know, you know, to help uh, troubleshoot or help um, uh, with with some of the issues that some of your clients um, on yeah. a daily basis. Well, what's what's really unique about our company? So our company, Project Solutions, we're a woman-owned company. We're actually an 8A company, a DBE as well. So we have a lot of these certifications. Um, okay. So we've gone through a lot of this process as well. And what we tend to do, especially with this program, is we will bring in. Our company has 
we have a wide range. Like I said, we do a lot of other contracts as well, construction management services as well. So depending on what the training is, we will pull people from anywhere to, to help out. So we have a team of HR professionals that, you know, they have all their qualifications, SHRM certifications, and when we're doing HR training, we'll bring them in and then they'll they'll talk about the different strategies and the industry trends. Um, it hasn't it's it's not uncommon for us to even bring our CEO in and she'll do mm. training with firms on, hey, here's how you get these certifications or here's how you uh, here's some business development tips. Here's how we bid on projects. Here's how you can bid on projects. So mm. it's a really you know, we, we try to really form a, a relationship with the people who use our services, really get to know them personally and professionally. And then we can throw, you know, our CFO will come in all the time and he'll do, uh, he'll look at their QuickBooks and do a lot of the financial stuff. So we really just try to get the best people in touch. Um, but I would say anywhere between 15 to 20 people that we may pull just for this alone. And if, if people mm -hmm. have very specific questions, you know, we scan our team to see, hey, this person has experience with this. They may know this better than they should jump on. So like I said, it, it really comes down to what the people are looking for specifically and and then putting our best people in, in front to, to give them that information. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I like that QuickBooks. Um, that was always a thing too um, that I come across with the smaller pickup and shovel guys, you mm -hmm. know, just doing it out of their shoebox or whatever. And I'm saying, no, you need to get a handle on your finances as big or small. Um, it it just it just makes their life so much easier um to have a handle on it and if you've got to farm it out farm it out but at least you know I do have a broad end do have that general understanding of what what's coming in and what's going out in terms of income and expenses so critical critical exactly a lot of these companies are you know somebody is just a, a an expert a, a tradesman or just an expert in whatever they do and they say you know what I can do this myself I don't need I can start my own business and they may be an expert at that craft but they may not know the business side of things Right. Uh, or even fully understand how much goes into that. Uh, mm -hmm. So sometimes our initial consults with people, it's it's a bit eye opening for them when they're like, man, I didn't even think about X, Y and Z. And I know they get that experience at PTAC offices and SBA offices as well when they first go in for that assistance. Mm -hmm. And you kind of just get your mind blown of like, man, Davis Bacon wages and all this in loan bond security. Oh. And like, I don't understand all of this. Um, and so that's when, you know, we're like, call us like we'll 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 calm you down. We'll point we'll, we'll make it bite-sized pieces point you in the right direction because everyone's got to go through it. So, you know, it's it's oh, yeah. just kind of one of the, that's just part of the game, you know? So it's it's good that these resources such as, you know, your office is, is available to, um, you know, being able to have these resources is incredibly important. So it's exciting that we, we, we have them available for people. Oh yeah. Yeah, I can completely empathize with these companies when they do decide to, to dive into um, and getting serious, you know, not just the local stuff, but also get after the state work or the federal stuff. And holy cow, you know, when I and I've been in economic development for well over 20 years, but it was more just on the the development side of things and just general business consultation. And yet we've got these contractors over here and we're trying to help them out, too. But once I stepped into that role as a PTAC, holy cow. Yeah, that was a that was an eye opener for me that I mean, just it's its own world. It's its own world. So um, as a contractor, you know, take advantage of your PTACs, take advantage of of jake here and their and their services absolutely um as much as you possibly can it's it's wonderful jake that you guys are out there and you've got this contract and and you're doing what you do yeah well again so, I, I i really appreciate the opportunity to speak here today thanks oh again, yeah. Brett. you bet you're welcome we'll probably i'd love to do it again um sean thank you for for popping in on us here you've got um jake's contact information if you want to visit with him further afterwards awesome um and with that um i'm gonna close our session today uh, we're coming to the end here um anybody that's interested also in the native american development center here in bismarck north dakota we have our credit builder program uh, for those individuals who are having challenges with their credit life, their credit invisible, or they've got a bad FICO score, you know, give us a call. We'd be we'd be happy to help you. I'm at 701-712-7284. I'll, fl I'll throw that um, contact information up at the end of this uh, program here as well today. So thank you again. Thank you, Jake. Thank you for everybody the, that uh, attended, Sean, and, and anybody else that, that uh, takes a look at this video in the future. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks Jake.